Lyme disease is a disease that was discovered relatively uh, recently and it happened in 1975 in town of Lyme, Connecticut and that's where the name came from. It's uh, more prevalent in the Northeast and uh, has become truly the most common tick-borne disease in the United States. So when Lyme disease is uh, diagnosed, it's usually a consequence of a tick bite. And um, tick uh, actually does not cause the Lyme disease, but tick is a vector and a carrier of the Borrelia burgdorferi bacterium. And uh, ticks uh, can transmit Borrelia burgdorferi to humans. It can take relatively long time for bacteria to incubate. It can on average take from 3 to 32 days, but sometime it may take several months. S bacteria can affect any organ and can cause variety of symptoms, can cause flu-like symptoms, um, constitutional symptoms such as chills, fever, malaise, patient may develop arthralgias, but the most characteristic sign is the bullseye, which is a circle, reddened circle, with a light colored center, and it will appear within days or weeks. So stages of Lyme disease, uh, first of all, bullseye rash, will appear and it's very characteristic sign and circle with a lighter center. After that patient may start developing cardiac and neurologic manifestations. At the second stage patient may develop patient may develop cardiac and neurological manifestations and the uh, patient may have complaints of chest pain or even ribs, the soreness, rib soreness, shortness of breath. Patient may complain of palpitation, um, may develop arrhythmias, uh, cardiac blocks, murmurs, uh, which may occur secondary to valvular prolapse certainly diagnostically cardiac echocardiogram may be necessary in this case um, and neurological symptoms may start as well so twitching of the face um, patient may have uh, spontaneous uh, tremors bell's palsy um, development, facial paralysis, uh, paresthesias, headaches, the, uh, confusion, uh, cognitive difficulties, difficulty concentrating, reading, poor short-term memory, disorientation. Multiple sclerosis is a disease of degeneration of myelin sheets in central neural system. It is the most common case of neurologic disability among young and middle-aged adults and the typical onset is uh, between ages 20 and 45. There is some genetic component in multiple uh, sclerosis inheritance however there is no direct inheritance but uh, it's been suggested that for second and third degree relatives of person with multiple sclerosis are at increased risk of developing MS and um, when we study twins we see that there is 25% concordance rate if in uh, monozygotic twins. When uh, demyelination 
of uh, subsequent degeneration of neural fibers in SNS happens, the patient may start experiencing symptoms. And what happened uh, when the nerve is demyelinated, the nerve uh, does not conduct electric signals properly and may have uh, different conduction abnormalities. These abnormalities can measure by the tests and it may measure the, the test may measure conduction velocity changes, decrease, or conduction block. And uh, this may depend also on the place of the lesion and uh, how long or how big is the lesion. Again, the abnormality of demyelination would happen. It's uh, disappearing or slowing down the signal. And imagine that wire, electric wire that has isolation on it that feeds, yeah, feeds your uh, light bulb on your desk. Uh, the isolation was stripped and it lays in the water, very dangerous condition, don't try it at home. But what happened, there is a chance that the electric signal don't get to the light bulb to light it up and the signal, the electricity will be lost and will be conducted through the water. So same thing happens in my multiple sclerosis. The signal either will slow down or completely will be blocked. So this is an autoimmune disorder and uh, the lymphocytic invasion of the lesion occurs when uh, demyelination occurs at the same time lymphocytes may invade the lesion. So there is some type of evidence that there is antibody mediated damage and uh, to the myelin proteins, the proteins that uh, build or that's, that are vital parts of myelin. So when you look at the nerve you will see hard or sclerotic patches and uh, you also would see in white matter that these patches are available, uh, or, I mean visible, and you don't need a microscope to see this. On autopsy it's possible to see those and myelin breakdown. You can see that those patches and uh, some call it plaque. They can appear anywhere in the brain, in brainstem, cerebellum, even spinal cord, white matter. If the plaque is fresh, you may see the evidence for active myelin breakdown. MRI is one of the ways to diagnose and evaluate for MS and it may show two types of lesions or two stages of them. It um, may show that uh, there is some inflammatory component and that's the stage one. And um, in second stage the formation of the scar occurred of the myelinated uh, nerve. So uh, basically the nerve's conduction again will be destroyed and uh, it will not be possible to conduct the signals normally. Clinically what happens the patient will again develop uh, neurologic symptoms, will um, have uh, speech and swallowing problems, uh, visual problems because optic nerve is affected. Um, there may be difficulties with gait and uh, 
there may be paresthesias again, uh, disturbance of, of visual field, diplopias, and uh, progressively patient may have um, uh, worsening. So there are several types of multiple sclerosis. So relapsing, remitting form of the disease is characterized by episodes when patient will feel and will present with acutely worsening symptoms and uh, after that patient may have some relapses, fairly stable periods of time. Secondary progressive disease will involve a gradual uh, deterioration, neurologic deterioration, and uh, and uh, there may be or may not be relapses, but in secondary progressive disease, uh, the relapses are not that common. And uh, in primary progressive disease, there is continuous neurologic deterioration from the time that symptoms are started. So again, there are three types, relapsing, re remitting, patient may have episodes of acute worsening and then getting in stable plato phase then after that n another s worsening there is secondary progressive disease which is gradual worsening with possibility of relapses and the third type is uh, primary progressive disease which is a uh, continuous neurologic progressive um, worsening of the patient, unfortunately, from the time that symptoms started. Amyotropic lateral sclerosis, it's one of the most devastating neurodegenerative diseases, and it's also the another name for it, Lou Gehrig's disease, after famous baseball player named and this is a disease of people in their late adult years 50s and 60s and um, the disease is very progressive and usually from the time of onset of symptoms it takes to approximately two to five years to death so how uh, what happens uh, and why the disease has this name. Let's talk a little bit about this. It's a death of lower motor neurons that occurs and when the lower motor neurons dying at the same time the denervation of course occurs and there, when there are no nerves connected to muscles, the muscle mass or the muscle fibers shrink. And um, so muscle fiber will present with atrophy. This type of atrophy is secondary to disease of the nerves or death of the nerves or denervation will be called amyotrophy. And uh, that's why the disease's name is amyotropic lateral sclerosis. The term lateral sclerosis reflects the fact that ne nerve fibers in lateral columns of white matter of the spinal column uh, are affected and lost. At the same time, disease does not affect the intellectual abilities, the regulatory uh, mechanism of coordination and control of movement and sensory systems. The neurons of, uh, <coughs> of uh, the neurons of ocular systems are also parasympathetic neurons and they are also basically ocular mobility and the parasympathetic neurons in the spinal column also spared. The cause again is uncertain. 
there is uh, some familial history and it's a very small share relatively small share of uh, affected patients but otherwise it's not really uh, determined why the disease happens and uh, there is a there are several mechanisms of ALS occurring and uh, there is possibility of uh, injury to uh, to the nerves through glutamate gated ion channels which will be uh, distinguished by sensitivity to n methyl d aspartic acid but again it's one of the theories and uh, there is no uh, certainty what causes the disease there is autoimmune source also described or suggested but disease at the same time would not respond to immunosuppressants so possibly it's not uh, autoimmune but again uh, the treat there is no cure really for the disease and uh, the care basically palliative the patient will be exposed to rehab techniques you know so patient may cope or may maintain the independence as longer as possible to prolong the survival times but unfortunately there is no um, uh, therapy no uh, cure for the disease uh, there is a drug it's a anti-glutamate drug again and it's named riluzole but riluzole is um, and uh, it's approved by FDA for the treatment of disease but um, unfortunately the use of drug prolonged the survival only by three to six months and they did trials but it's already approved drug so hopefully there will be something else uh, on the market soon but again um, the take-home message about this the atrophy of the muscles the disease also will not affect the intellectual abilities at all but symptoms of ALS will uh, be a result of muscle deficits and patient may experience su such consequences as uh, dysphagia, dysarthria, and dysarthria doesn't have anything to do with joints. It's uh, inability to talk or articulate the speech and dysphonia again in rehab evaluation and treatment it's um, important to involve the entire healthcare team and by healthcare team i mean not only um, nursing and uh, medical staff but also auxiliary services such as speech therapy and uh, physical therapy again the goal is to prolong the survival time or which is better to provide the quality of life to maintain the quality of life not just prolonged life neuropathies are uh, peripheral neurosystem disorders and uh, neuropathy is truly it's not a single disorder but it's some type of collection or cluster of disorders uh, and neuropathy occurs when so talking about guillain barre syndrome this is an acquired inflammatory disease and uh, another way to describe the Guillain-Barre syndrome is as an acute immune mediated polyneuropathy so 
clinically we can define it as rapidly progressive weakness of the limbs and uh, loss of tendon reflexes and uh, technically uh, the Guillain Barre syndrome will be the most common cause of acute paralysis and because uh, currently that's the Guillain Barre syndrome but of course in the past it was polyamylitis there are several types of Guillain Barre syndrome which uh, at this time we will focus on the main type of the syndrome and which will be we will be talking about uh, Guillain Barre syndrome that has an immune component so in Guillain Barre syndrome some type of exposure to a virus or an offending agent occurs and uh, the studies done in epidemiology they linked the infection to Campylobacter, Cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr and Mycoplasma and the um, majority of the patients will report that they had uh, flu-like illness prior to the onset of symptoms and um, some patients will have antibodies against gangliosides which in some cases uh, which be uh, it would be consistent with uh, infections with Campylobacter so what happens symptomatically there is progressive ascending muscle weakness of the limbs and it will produce a symmetric flaccid paralysis paresthesia will occur and at the same time loss of neuro um, uh, I'm sorry loss of motor function progression is relatively fast but it may vary of course the speed this proportionate involvement or upper or lower extremities may occur and uh, pr paralysis uh, in ascending case will be progressing upward and uh, there is significant number of people with Guillain Barre syndrome which will present with involvement of respiratory muscle um, autonomic neurosystem also can be involved and when we have an autonomic involvement we are exposed to the dangers of cardiac arrhythmias and uh, also the symptoms like autonomic dysfunction symptoms such as sweating and facial flushing urinary retention but at the same time patient with autonomic dysfunction will have uh, postural hypertension or orthostatically you will get different numbers and also patient will express will have quite significant amount of pain in some cases it's a medical emergency Guillain Barre syndrome but at the same time it's very treatable um, approximately 90% of people affected will achieve full recovery but the problem with this and there is no problem really with this but it's the duration unfortunately takes recovery takes up to one year to fully recover and, um, and some time um, patient will require ventilatory support to treat Guillain Barre because of uh, and also support of other vital functions and uh, patient uh, may need supportive care for to prevent uh, 
skin breakdown, thrombophlebitis, and uh, again, um, the treatment is mostly supportive and also ventilator is supportive involvement of uh, respiratory muscles is present and at that time patients will require ventilatory assistance so but overall the recovery rate is approximately 90 percent and patients will present with full recovery up in one year radiculopathy is myasthenia gravis is a chronic autoimmune disease and a short version of etiology will be uh, the fact that neuromuscular junction is affected so there is no communication between motor neuron and the muscle cell the innervated muscle cell um, it's fairly uh, young people disease someone in 20s or 30s can be affected but again it may affect anyone uh, uh, of any age more common in women than men so as an autoimmune disease it's caused by antibody mediated destruction of acetylcholine receptors and those receptors are located in neuromuscular junction we don't know the exact mechanism but uh, it's believed to be related to abnormal T lymphocyte function and uh, most of the people with myasthenia graphis may uh, present with thymus abnormalities as well so what are the symptoms of uh, myasthenia gravis patients will have less acetylcholine receptors in uh, postsynaptic membrane and uh, what will happen from the each release uh, of acetylcholine from presynaptic membrane will result with lower end plate potential so what happens the muscle will be presenting with weakness and fatigue when patient is trying to make a movement or um, just use that muscle most commonly affected and for one of the first symptoms that will occur that's extra extraocular muscles and the I remember from one of my uh, clinical rotation as a student nurse practitioner we seen the patient who were who was complaining of diplopia while driving and the actual cause turned around that it was turned out that it was myasthenia gravis onset and the gentleman was in his late 50s and um, myasthenia gravis may be resulting in sudden exacerbation of symptoms which may be called myasthenia crisis so crisis is when you're thinking about crisis it's a condition when the ventilation occur uh, affected and this may happen after some kind of stressor stress like emotional stress infection too much alcohol or surgical intervention also the treatment is the replenishment of acetylcholine in some uh, way or shape so the stress may result result of the stress will be that acetylcholine nasterase drugs are not enough the patient or Another result will be that, another cause, I'm sorry, will be that patient isn't using enough drugs for treatment of this. Diagnosis given based on history and physical examination, but of course patient has to undergo to acetylcholinesterase test 
and uh, immunoassays and uh, acetylcholinesterase test will be using Tensilon, which is one of the drugs that inhibits actual acetylcholinesterase and Tensilon is actually used for treatment. But what happens when, in this case, you give Tensilon to the patient, patient symptoms are rapidly decreasing and patient is improving, like disease is gone at that point. So positive Tensilon test will be diagnostic for myasthenia gravis, but also um, electrophysiology studies can be done, such as uh, studies that will demonstrate like that muscles do not respond to uh, stimulation of motor nerves. So treatments will be using pharmacological agents. There are two ways to do this and first is immunosuppressive therapy and again corticosteroids in this case as well as medications that may be uh, affecting cholinesterase such as tensilon. So another treatment is when thymus gland may be completely removed, but um, it's somewhat controversial uh, treatment because truly the mechanism is not known very well of the disease. So we will have a short overview of mental health disorders and we'll talk about schizophrenia mood disorders and anxiety disorders in this part. Schizophrenia is a type of psychosis and uh, schizophrenia would be a certain collection of disorder that basically thought disorder. Psychotic individuals may have delusions, hallucination, impaired coping skills, and um, impaired communication. Swiss psychiatrist Eugene Bluller used the term uh, schizophrenia first time in eight, 1911 but disease itself was first uh, described and uh, distinguished as a separate mental illness by Dr. Emil Krapelin in 1887, but at that time the term was dementia precox, and uh, when we read the description of the Emil Krapelin's the, he when he describes the symptoms we can see that these are the symptoms of schizophrenia even though we say that disease is recent like the naming and diagnostic of the disease is recent but of course through the centuries people had symptoms of schizophrenia and people had schizophrenia even reviewing ancient sources starting from ancient Egypt, um, the, there are descriptions that are very similar to symptoms of schizophrenia. When uh, patients starting experiencing symptoms of schizophrenia, most likely this will happen in relatively early age. It's um, teenage years to mid-twenties, but um, it's uncommon if patient is having diagnosis of schizophrenia in older, at older time, and if that happens, most likely the disease was undiagnosed earlier. But uh, when patient develops the disease uh, the one thing 
comes to mind first and it's the low, lo loss of touch with reality and um, the reality is replaced by imagined or uh, fantasy reality and by fantasy reality it's not that reality is uh, made up by the patient by, but uh, patient truly believes and has mood or affective disorders are the disorders that will involve emotions and the outward representation of the emotions so when we're talking about emotions we can call it mood but the representation of the emotions we can call affect so affective states are brief emotional feelings that are um, more or less visible and more or less uh, manifested in the patient. Well, you can observe it in the patient, but mood is again a sustained emotional state. Again, common misconception and over-treatment in primary care and even in psychiatric setting, uh, sometimes that uh, not understanding the fact that people may experience times of sadness and uh, times of extreme happiness. So when these emotions are appropriate to the time or to the experiences in life, we do not have a disorders. Uh, for instance, someone is grieving because of the loss of a, a significant other, and at this time, uh, we do not have a depression per se. However, if there are emotions not appropriate, uh, for the events or they last inappropriate uh, duration of time or they are extreme in nature the mood disorder can be suspected and diagnosed and again these are all relative terms in psychiatry and uh, appropriate or inappropriate everyone reacts differently. However, the extremes can be diagnostic for mood disorders. And a uh, good example is a manic depressive disorder or as currently we call it bipolar disorder, which alternates manic and depressive state. Depression is a prolonged feeling of extreme sadness and unhappiness, despair, discouragement, and we need to learn as healthcare providers to differentiate it from grief, which is realistic sadness related to a loss, to a personal loss, and loss can be a person and an animal or patient may grieve because of the loss of the function or loss of a limb but uh, this is expected manifestation prolonged grief may become depression however if patient if the person isn't able to cope with this they may experience uh, symptoms of depression. So uh, there are genetic uh, manifestations of genetic uh, background for uh, depression as well as biological and environmental factors may certainly play a role. Um, in some cases, it can be one single factor. In other cases, it's multifactorial. But however, nobody truly knows why some people would experience depression and the other may not. But we have some 
well established causes for depression but again there is no clear picture per se even though we treat depression relatively well nowadays and we know how to manage it but again we don't know exactly how depression occurs so what are the causes uh, of the depression will be of course genetic heredity um, personality and again personality can be tied to heredity and environment situational depression is a different uh, type of depression and this is uh, reaction to a situation however if the situational depression is or reaction to the situation is prolonged this may be cause of uh, situational depression medical conditions can affect uh, development of depressions and for instance the best example is hypothyroidism people who develop hypothyroidism very often will de develop depression and suicide suicidal thoughts and uh, the symptoms are completely reversed when the patient is put on levothyroxine or synthroid and uh, this is definitely a very strong correlation between hypothyroid state and depression um, substance abuse can be another source of depression dietary deficiencies such as folic acid and b12 and gender is a risk factor females are at more risk to develop repression and uh, age elderly uh, socioeconomic status the income level and lower socioeconomic status may be uh, resulting in depression extreme weight again um, can be resulting in depression and social isolation and people who live alone although the cause and the consequence here is difficult to pinpoint because do they live alone because they are depressed or they are depressed because they are alone so patient uh, when they are experiencing depression will experience a feeling of rejection helplessness helplessness and feeling of being worthless disinterest in surrounding and disinterest in events that used to be pleasurable and the word for it is ahedonia or ahedonia because the patient experiences loss of interest in previously pleasurable activities irritability may even have suicidal thoughts easily crying and uh, either lack of sleep or excessive sleep depression may occur during critical period in life and it may affect uh, growing up like adolescence or going through menopause it also can be common and also uh, events such as retirement and entering into a uh, new work environment so uh, this all can affect the depression so diagnosis again can be made by a thorough medical physical examination and uh, also questionnaires can be done but physical examination again important plus lab workup because several conditions may be reflected as depression again as thyroid so uh, uh, depression truly is the diagnosis of exception because first of all uh, your job is to rule out a an organic a physical source of depression then think about psychological psychiatric illness besides the depression the cohort of 
uh, mood disorders can be also uh, can include seasonal affective disorders and again the seasonal affective disorder is speculated to be related to circadian rhythms of the person and the treatment usually is the same as the depression however some uh, activities mimicking the longer duration of uh, daylight the, or a day a bright light during the winter months may decrease the seasonal affective disorders symptomatology also another disorder is bipolar disorder which i wouldn't spend much time on it because it was well covered in undergraduate nursing curriculum and uh, just main thing here uh, in bipolar disorders the genetic component certainly present and the treatment may include uh, mood stabilizers as well as antidepressants use of antidepressants in bipolar treatment is somewhat controversial because they may exacerbate the manic episode so generally the uh, antidepressant medications work on uh, somehow altering a pathway of communication between uh, in the synaptic cleft and uh, different uh, neurotransmitters may be affected by the work or by the action of the antidepressants so here in this picture is uh, a depiction of the work of ssris and how it um, occurs on the section d the ssri interrupt neurotransmitters relief and uh, reuptake i'm sorry neurotransmitter reuptake so we do have in synaptic cleft sufficient amount of neurotransmitter which uh, in which provides the um, halting of the depressive symptoms there are three major classes of antidepressant uh, medication monoxidase uh, inhibitors which are currently very seldom prescribed because of the uh, side effects and uh, their possibility of adverse effects such as um, overdose uh, can be very severe with this tricyclic antidepressant also almost not prescribed for it. depression and so, some of them such as amitriptyline will be prescribed for the sleep disorders so the mainstay of antidepressive therapy is SSRIs selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and uh, again those medications work in in the synaptic cleft and they are inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin in this case snri it's uh, some consider it as subcategory of ssris but uh, it's uh, certainly a, a separate type of drug they act uh, quite similar by affecting the reuptake of uh, neurotransmitter but at this point they are covering quite several neurotransmitters and they can cover norepinephrine serotonin as well as dopamine so they may work uh, not only on depression but also on disorders such as anxiety anxiety disorders is um, the condition that is a can be considered from deviation of from normal normally anxiety is a response to stress 
and uh, which uh, induces fight or flight response in some individuals but for others anxiety may become a chronic problem the individual may experience anxiety that is exaggerated or inappropriate to the situation um, and anxiety uh, before was called anxiety disorder as neurosis it's are truly the largest mental health disorder in the United States numerically I mean that's the biggest uh, number of people affected the cause of the anxiety disorder is again unknown with certainly although genetic factors stress environment biochemical alteration and even physical causes can be pinpointed and physical causes may be studied a little better and in physical causes things like hyperthyroidism may affect development of anxiety so anxiety has several um, types and the different uh, manifestation but one of the extreme uh, manifestation of anxiety disorder is panic disorder panic disorder is state of extreme and uncontrollable fever which we may call a panic attack and um, it's usually very sudden onset and peaks in a uh, few minutes and the patient may experience a feeling of impending doom and uh, patient would like to escape and run away from it and also psychosomatic uh, I'm sorry somatic manifestation may be present such as diaphoresis uh, chest pain tachycardia patient may experience nausea and uh, dissociation you know generalized anxiety disorder it's a feeling of excessive worry it's a continuous state of mind to intense anxiety. It's not related to a specific event. Anxiety is called freeloading. It's a state of constant anxiety that may be leading even to somatic manifestations again such as uh, nausea vomiting diarrhea and uh, dryness in the mouth and again tachycardia so all of this like um, exaggerated states and the uh, patient uh, leaves basically on the edge always being uh, ready for some impending drastic events post-traumatic stress disorder is uh, the development of the reaction as a response to psychologically stressful event that the person couldn't control and uh, it was outside of normal human experiences disorder is uh, a relatively new addition to anxiety disorders and uh, uh, it may be observed in war veterans also victims who uh, are victims of rape abuse uh, or survivors of natural disaster um, so people who deal with extreme situations such as policemen and firemen are at higher risk to develop post-traumatic stress disorder <coughs> and uh, symptom can occur immediately after the event or they may be staying dormant until several months after the trauma diagnosis in uh, of post-traumatic stress disorder again um, 
includes the thorough physical examination to rule out other physical or organic conditions that may result in the development of uh, similar symptoms. And uh, but diagnosis is established also by confirming the history of symptoms and uh, making sure that there are no other conditions are present. Treatment may include uh, stress reduction, hypnosis, relaxation, exercise therapy, biofeedback, also medications, treatment with uh, antidepressants may be beneficial or anti-anxiety agent. The, some studies suggest that rapid debriefment after uh, being exposed to a, a traumatic event will uh, have higher result versus debriefment after a few days when the event occur. Obsessive compulsive disorder is an anxiety disorder with two parts. Obsession is a repetition of a thought or emotion and compulsion is repetitive act. And um, it affects the individual uh, in a way that person cannot resist not performing that act or get rid of the thought. With OCD, the person is unable to stop the thought or the action. And behavior becomes some type of ritual and uh, thoughts or attempts to stop the ritual may lead to extreme anxiety. The behavior will become very time consuming and uh, in some healthcare providers like hand washing can become obsessive compulsive behavior. Um, so, and also it may become disruptive to the job activities <coughs> such as uh, p someone who has a desk clerical job obsessed with cleaning the objects or pr maintaining clean desk surface or a nurse who or a uh, doctor who is obsessed with uh, washing hands uh, continuously. Uh, the treatment will include anti-anxiety agents and sometimes SSRIs or even SNRIs may be prescribed for this and um, results can be very uh, reassuring with treatment with SSRIs. Also psychotherapy at the same time will be also of benefit.